With the ideas now of impedance and impedance matching, we can talk about the middle ear and how it might be modeled as an impedance matching system. The purpose of the middle ear is to help fix the impedance mismatch between the area of sound as it comes down from the air in the air canal and as it tries to get impacted or transmitted from to the cochlea to the to the oval window of the cochlea so we go ear canal to oval window of cochlea and on this end we have air because that's what the vast sound vibrations are being transmitted through in the ear canal but when it hits the oval window of the cochlea we now have liquid right we have basically fluid fluid liquid that's being that's that needs to be get rid in order for the cochlea to function and pick up the sound right to stimulate the hair cells and transmit the nerve impulses to the cochlear to the cochlear nerve any time that there's a interface shift a change of interstate that energy needs to go from one interface that's homogeneous to a different one that's that's not the same that change of medium or interface uh, transfer energy energy transfer through an interface may or may not be uh, well matched. Now it turns out for the purposes of air and fluid or air and liquid, like air and water, it's highly, highly not matched. It's so not matched that something on the order of greater than 99.9% .9 of the energy that's coming from the air going into the fluid is lost. It's just reflected back into the air and a tiny fraction will end up actually being passed into the fluid. If mammalian ears and auditory systems were set up without any impedance matching systems, this the, the the ability to detect sound would be extremely limited the middle ear does precisely that it provides an impedance matching circuit so that the impedance of the air and the impedance of the liquid are better managed such that you have something that's much better than 99.9 .9 energy lost in fact along the ranges of interest it actually does quite a decent job. It can transmit somewhere on the area of 50 to 75% of the energy um, between the frequencies of, of 300 to 3000, which is quite impressive. Which means that if you think about the way that it's changing, right? What it's doing is that when you have a 99.9% .9 loss, you have a significant reactive component here. And a very small resistive component, such that remember, since only the since only since power is only dissipated over the resistive component, in order for you to have a 99.9% .9 loss, you have a much we must have a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the total power, right? The magnitude of Z um, that's actually present in R. So there's a huge phase shift that's not being well compensated. Mid the middle ear helps pull this reactance closer to to purely real. It might also pull it up, depending on pull it down, depending on whether it's inductive or capacitive. We haven't said anything about that yet. So the model that we're pulling from is a derivative of, of the Zwislocki model. And in the 1960s, Zwislocki was one of the first scientists to publish uh, a circuit model that well described the properties, the impedance matching properties of the middle ear. 
The simple model, we aren't going to go through the Zuslaki model because it's quite complicated. We're going to go through a simplified model here. This was like in 1962, 68, I forget the year, 62. This was 1962. Um, it's actually a very nice paper. Uh, it's called The Analysis of the Middle Ear Function Part 1 Input Impedance. And it was published in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. Journal of ASA. The model we'll be looking at here instead is a much, much simplified uh, model that sort of borrows from the Suslaki model. And it was published in a, a recent paper in 1995 by uh, Emila, H-E-M-I-L-A with the umlaut. And this was in 1995, and this was in the Journal of Hearing Research. Is it Journal of Hearing Research or Just Hearing Research? I always forget. It is Just Hearing Research. And, oops, it's missing an E. And figure 5B of this paper puts out a circuit model that is quite nice and intuitive in its understanding of, in its modeling of the middle ear. So let's set up the terminals here and here. We have a capacitor here. We have a capacitor here. This is C not nor C zero. This is CP. I'll go over these terms in just a moment for what they mean. This is CS. This is the only inductor they're modeling here, so they just left it as L. And for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to leave the inner ear as purely resistive R, even though it's technically not. Um, it's nice to think of it as mostly, it's actually mostly resistive, but it sort of stops becoming resistive once you get purely resistive, once you get to frequencies um, sort of above, uh, above about one and a half kilohertz or so, two kilohertz, then this constant resistance doesn't model the system well at all. So this is inner ear, right? This is our load. And this is our middle ear, everything else in here. And each of these actually means something quite intuitive. C naught here is the compliance of the middle ear air cushion between the tympanic membrane and, well, the inner ear. There's a bunch of air that is effectively encased. It's not communicating usually with the outside. That has a compliance, right? Because it has stretchiness that is different than the incoming, incoming compliance of the ear canal. And so C naught represents, I'm gonna erase this for a moment so I have a little more room. C naught represents that compliance. C naught is the compliance, oops. compliance of air in middle ear, M-E. Now we see P, and CP represents the, the compliance of the tympanic membrane that is more compliant than the first middle ear bone, the malleus. The fact that there is a difference in the stretchiness, right? Where the, where the, where the this is compliance of tympanic membrane being greater than that of the malleus. The fact that there's a compliance incompatibility here means that some energy is being 
absorbed by the tympanic membrane that it can then deliver back out right into the circuit. So that's why it's, a, it's modeled here as this parallel short. What is the function, right, of the CO? The CO here is going to sit there and block, for example, some very low frequency sounds, right? That's what a capacitor that's in series does. And then think about it. If you just have this giant cushion of air that's resisting, uh, resisting the tympanic membrane from being pushed too much, then that is going to limit low frequency sounds, right? It's going to, it's going to be a, it's going to be like a DC, a DC offset resistance. CS is the compliance of the ligaments, right? So compliance of ligaments and muscles of the middle ear bones, of the middle ear bones. The bones of the middle ear are held together and being pulled uh, and are under tension. Technically, we're modeling this as a constant, but as you go across different dynamic ranges, right, CS could change and it could get tighter. It could, it, you know, as the muscles pull tighter, what's going to happen then to the CS? Well, as, as the stiffness of a, of a piece of membrane goes up, the compliance goes down. And what that means is it's going to prevent right, more, it's going to prevent amplitude from being pushed through here. So right, the, if they have these big waves coming through, if it faces a very stiff, low compliant CS, it's going to block a lot of that power from actually passing through, which is sort of what the purpose of those ligaments and, and bones are, or ligaments and muscles that are attached to the bones. And then finally, we have L. And L represents the inductance well, it's the inductance of the middle ear bones, which is based on the inertial mass. Of the middle ear bones. It turns out that any object with mass that's attached to some moving system has inertia, right? That's part of the first law of, of, of motion. And it will not want to move from its location. So mass itself rep is, is, can be modeled as an inductor. There's actually a mechanical equivalent to electric circuits. Just like there's a water analogy, there's a mechanical analogy uh, that relates how capacitors, inductors, and resistors can be modeled in physical mechanical systems. And there, mass is an inductor. And this is it. This is the impedance matching circuit of the middle ear, at least as described in Amila 1995. It's extremely useful because it helps us understand how power coming in through the system can be matched so that more of it actually goes through the inner ear and actually get transmitted into the cochlea. And the mathematics behind this, how you can simplify this is a very good exercise to go through to understand what this type of a model is doing when it converts sound into uh, air, when it converts uh, signals coming from air into, into something that is passing into the fluid medium.